Hey, in this video, I will introduce you to the radio equipment directive in the EU. And it's a fairly complex directive, so I'll do my very best to, to try to help you make sense of this. We'll start with the product scope, help you understand the, well, the products that are covered by the directive, then we'll move on to general requirements. And, and I can tell you right away, and I'm not going to go into, into all the technical details, but more so help you navigate the different parts of the directive that we give you details, some of which apply um, to specific types of products. Then we'll move on to the documentation requirements labeling requirements and finally the usb type c requirements which concerns well the eu made it essentially mandatory for a wide range of, of devices to to use uh, usb type c as as the interface so that's a pretty big change and something that you definitely have to be aware of if you're working with electronics in any capacity okay look at the overall requirements here. So the directive sets essential requirements for the safety and electromagnetic compatibility of radio equipment and the efficient use of radio spectrum to essentially ensure that electronics are covered by this directive, are safe, don't interfere with other devices, and don't interfere with the, the radio spectrum to interfere with uh, signals between other devices. Now, when it comes to the definition of, of um, products that are radio equipment, you can find this in Article 2, Part 1. And radio equipment means uh, an electronic device which intentionally emits or receives radio waves for the purpose of radio communication. And this means that Wi-Fi enabled devices, 5G, Bluetooth, essentially all devices that have some form of wireless communications would then very likely be covered by the by the RED, by the radio equipment directive. Examples would include well, this laptop, um, a wireless Bluetooth enabled mouse, my phone, um, wireless earphones and so on. So covers a very broad range of, of, of electronics these days. Let's look at the general requirements or more specifically where you can find more information about these because it, it depends uh, very much on the product. But just to give you an idea of where to start, the Radio Equipment Directive sets requirements concerning the design and, and manufacture. And this is what they call the essential requirements not perhaps technical requirements in the sense that they provide exact technical specifications, but the broad requirements that must be um, reached. And you can find information about this in Article 3 and 3A. Second, the RED requires that radio equipment is, is designed in, in the sense that it can be operated in at least one member state in the EU without interfering with uh, the radio spectrum. And this concerns uh, certain frequencies and so on to ensure that this um, do not interfere with uh, with other, um, well, radio signals to ensure that to operate within a certain band and so on. So you can find information about that in Article 10 too. Third, we have the conformity assessment procedure, and this is the procedure that must be followed in order to demonstrate that the product is compliant. There's a variety of different modules that give you a essentially um, overall uh, requirements list, which in turn depends on on the product and whether you can apply something called harmonized standards. Okay, I understand it. This sounds sounds a bit complicated. I'm going to try to make some sense out of this. Now, if there are harmonized standards in existence for the product, and the harmonized standard is essentially it's it's a, it's a reference standard that can be applied to a certain product type or a certain module or an aspect of a product, then module A can in many cases be applied. Module A is essentially self-certification, self-managed compliance. You issue the documents, you pick the testing company, you create the label files, 
and then you can determine that the product is is compliant. That's that's the essence of module A, and you can find that information in in Annex two. If that is not the case, then you may need to follow module B and C, which requires the involvement of a notified body and the issuance of an EC type examination certificate. If you're new to the concept of notified bodies, then we have another video dedicated to notified bodies. I'm not going to go into further detail about that. And finally, as is the case with most directives, the RED does not provide exact technical requirements for all types of products. Instead, it leaves that job to harmonize standards. Harmonized standards are essentially recognized in the sense that if you can identify a harmonized standard that applies to your product or the module, and the product is then proven to be compliant with said harmonized standard, and keep in mind, it could be more than one that applies to a given product, then the product is deemed to be compliant. Then you have essentially reached step one here. Well, point one, which is that you have then complied with the essential requirements. So in a way, the, 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 the role of the harmonized standard is to give, is to provide a roadmap, a roadmap in terms of technical requirements that can deliver you to compliance, that can ensure that you have a path to reach the overall compliance objectives of that entire directive. And the reason that we have different harmonized standards is because there are so many different products. The good news is you can find a list of harmonized standards for the RED on the European Commission website. And here I'm showing you just a few of these. And again, it can be more than one of these that apply to a given product. So when it comes to harmonized EN standards, we essentially follow a three-step procedure. And step one is to identify the applicable standards that apply under the RED to my product. And if you don't know how to do that, you can work with consultants, you can work with a testing company, and they can likely help you with that assessment. Step two, you need to design for compliance. This, this requires a, an understanding of the technical requirements, implementation, which in some cases may be needed at the drawing board. I would say not just in some, but in most cases necessary to implement compliance, design for compliance. And when it comes to the, the bill of materials, the PCB schematics and so on, the wiring diagram. So it does, it does require, um, does require an understanding of, of, of well, it, it requires expertise in, in, in electronic engineering. That's really what I want to say here. And step three, lab testing. Even if you follow module A, even if you self-certify, if I can use that term, well, you still need verification. You still need to demonstrate that the product has been verified as compliant. That's why step three is lab testing. and end of the day, lab testing is necessary for almost all products covered by the RED, simply for the sake of ver verifying. Let's look at documentation. The first part is to issue a declaration of conformity. You may be familiar with familiar with the declaration of conformity if, if you've been working with electronics before. And you can find uh, you can find an item list for the DOC. Well, the information, the headlines you need to put in a DOC in Annex in Annex 6. Something that is unique, well, not entirely unique, but somewhat unique for the RED is that you actually need to provide a physical declaration of conformity with the product. Um, luckily, you don't need to provide the entire DOC. Instead, it's sufficient if you provide a, a simplified DOC, which is a headline, a statement, and then a link, well, a URL to the complete declaration of conformity. And this could be, say, an insert in, in the product box or maybe part of the user instructions or something like that. Second, you need to draw up technical documentation, and you can find an item list in Article 21, technical documentation, it's essentially, it's, it's essentially a complete product specification, um, wiring diagrams, uh, casings, yeah, casing files, 
what else, bill of materials, source code. And it also needs to include all the compliance documentation, meaning that you would have copies of the declaration of conformity and the simplified declaration of conformity. You would also include label files for the product and for the packaging, test reports. You can see it as a folder. That's usually what it is, a folder where you include all the product specifications and all the compliance related documents and files that if you would be, let's say, subject to a recall or review, then they would be able to, well, and they being, say, market surveillance authorities would be then given access to this file and they would then be able to determine to what extent the product is non-compliant and so on. So that's, that's essentially the, the reason that they make this mandatory. And finally, you need to issue um, instructions, uh, instructions manual, user instructions and safety information, different requirements depending on the product. You can find information about this in Article 10. And here you can see a sample of the EU declaration of conformity from, from Annex 6. With the product name, name and address of the manufacturer or importer for that matter. You need to list the specific harmonized standards that uh, apply to the product and finally sign it. And Article 21, as you can see, also provides information, but well, essentially lists a broad item list uh, for what you need to include in, in the technical documentation. But it's, it's not as specific as, as the previous one. It's a bit more open-ended in that sense. Let's look at the labeling requirements. So the Radio Equipment Directive requires a C mark. So the C mark is a compliance mark that you can find in a variety of different products, in, including electronics, as you may know. And the C mark is in this context used to symbolize, to, to signal that the product is, is compliant with the radio equipment directive and that you have followed the, uh, the, the modules that apply. And what makes the RED somewhat different from say the low voltage directive or ROHS is that the C mark should also be followed by the identification number of the, of the notified body if you have applied a module that involves a notified body. And as mentioned, that depends on the status concerning harmonized standards. Could be other factors involved too, for that matter. Finally, labeling requirements also cover traceability. And you can find information on the traceability informa information they require in Article 10. Uh, part six and seven and traceability is it's is a common requirement when it comes to, to all products that carry the C mark and essentially need to include a product name, model, batch number, information about the manufacturer or import as company name, contact point and so on. This is usually applied to the product and to the packaging. All right, so now we come to um, Annex 1A. And Annex 1A is it's an addition from uh, to the RED, a consolidated version that came out, if I remember correctly, on December 27th, 2022. And what it states is that, well, this has been debated in the EU. And what it states is that well, now that it's, it's not a debate anymore, but it's actually it's, it's, it's in the form of a directive. What it states is that certain devices must be equipped with the USB type C uh, receptacle. I never heard that word before, but anyway, that's a term they use. And um, as described in uh, ENIC 62680 1 3 2021. So essentially, that's the that's the interface that's now made mandatory, not for all electronics, but for a wide range of electronics that you can find a list in directive. And that's why we're seeing brands like Apple and so on actually ditching their 
what is it called the lighting interface um, and the purpose is to in the purpose is um, well I'm, I I haven't been following the debate that closely but I believe it's related to reducing um, electronics waste and and some critics would say that it's going too far to standardize to standardize an interface like this but at the same time imagine if we had like 15 different power sockets or even three different types of power sockets that would be a problem then of course we'll see how how this will develop in the future now part two here is that uh, they also require that uh, you include a certain pictogram um, to indicate if a uh, an ac adapter or charger is included with the radio equipment and you can also find uh, the full text in annex 1a by the way Look at these pictograms because there are a few different 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 versions here so in part three that's where you can find these pictograms by the way and uh, the first one it indicates if a charging device is included this has to be on the packaging it needs to be visual that's my understanding anyway this is the one you use if no charging device is included i can imagine this we're going to see on the iphone boxes then And other than that, must also be combined with um, certain information. And you can find details. It concerns, I think, power consumptions and so on. Um, you can then find in the annex inside the radio equipment directive on the European Commission website. Okay. Um, I hope that this served at least as an introduction to the radio equipment directive. I really hope you have at least some understanding of the requirements. If you have questions, uh, you can write your questions in the comment section on YouTube, or you can do the same on our website, compliancegate.com, and do our best to get back to you. Thank you.